I want to go over making sense of the JFK assassination because I want to emphasize the importance of the Cold War in understanding the JFK assassination. One of the reasons why people believe in conspiracy when there is really no evidence of conspiracy is because they don't understand how a president could be assassinated by a non-entity like Lee Harvey Oswald. But if you understand the Cold War and how it affected the minds of Americans, including the minds of President Kennedy and the mind of Lee Harvey Oswald, then it suddenly makes sense. So let's go through and see why. First of all, the context in time is so important. So let's go back and look at the beginnings of the Cold War, something that may be new to you and certainly is new to most people. The Cold War began in 1947 when the United States decided that it could not make deals with its erstwhile partner from the Second World War, the Soviet Union, and that the Soviet Union would have to be resisted by some kind of force, short of a world war, of course, but some kind of resistance, hopefully not in the form of troops and war, but in the form perhaps of aid to our allies. So that was in 1947. In 1949, the Cold War became darker and more dangerous when China became a communist country and the Soviets exploded their atomic bomb. Between 1950 and 1953, there was an actual hot war that coincided simultaneously with the Cold War called the Korean War, in which thousands of American soldiers were killed. And this, of course, ratcheted up the tension of what was supposed to be not a hot war, but a cold war. Then from 1950 to 1954, you have what's called McCarthyism, where a particular senator from Wisconsin basically lied and said that the government was infiltrated with communists sworn to the destruction of the American government. Because this was a new thing, that is, for senators to lie, most people believed McCarthy, and it intensified fear of communism and led to all kinds of abridgments and violations of free speech, and people's jobs were jeopardized, if not destroyed, by this time of tension. And so this increased anti-communist fears in the United States. Throughout the 1950s, under the Eisenhower administration, the CIA got into the habit of overthrowing governments in Iran and Latin America in secret. These were secret coups launched by the United States CIA without the knowledge of the American people, because obviously the United States is not supposed to be in the business of toppling foreign governments. So this was the habit-forming problem of government overreach. None of this was explicitly constitutional. Continuing the context, you have the Castro and Cuban Revolution in 1959, when Fidel Castro became a communist, and you have a, a nation in Latin America that was supposedly allied with our mortal enemies, the Russians, and there was a fear that this would spread to the rest of Latin America. In 1961, John F. Kennedy became president, and he promised a hard line in the Cold War. He said we would bear any burden, oppose any foe on behalf of liberty. And yet, in 1961, JFK suffered defeats in Berlin, Vienna, Cuba, and Laos in Southeast Asia. In Berlin, you have the Berlin Wall that get, went up in August 1961. Sorry, JFK met with Khrushchev in Vienna, and everybody thought that Khrushchev had basically uh, browbeaten JFK and that JFK suffered a 
public relations failure in Vienna. And of course, at the Bay of Pigs in 1961, there was a failed invasion of Cuba by supposed rebels of Fidel Castro, but the invasion had been backed up by the United States, again, in secret. And when the invasion failed, American involvement became known, and this gave JFK really a black eye. Hatred of Cuba intensified in the White House at this time, largely because of the failure of the Bay of Pigs, and RFK directed the CIA to target Castro personally. In 1962, the world came very close to the brink of nuclear war with the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the Soviets planted missiles in Cuba aimed at the United States and JFK ordered that they be removed or else there would be a third world war. And for 13 days, there was no certainty that the world would escape nuclear war, but fortunately it was solved when the Russians agreed to remove the missiles. In 1963, JFK continued to plot against Castro and publicly hinted that these plots were underway. Now, JFK did not publicly hint, but there were hints in the newspaper, and people were wondering whether the government was doing something to get rid of Castro in 1963. It wasn't verified, but from time to time, it was noised about in the newspapers. Also in 63, JFK secretly hinted that he would have peace with Cuba, that he would make a deal with Castro. Castro was very angry at the Soviet Union for caving in to JFK over the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so JFK thought that he could reach out to Castro. But some of these initiatives, in fact, all of them, were secret at the time. Throughout 1963, Castro accused JFK of plotting an assassination against him. At least two times, these accusations by Castro were published in the newspapers, newspapers that we know Lee Harvey Oswald read, and it is likely that this played some part in Oswald's motivation. It seemed to Oswald that assassination was a game that two could play, that it was fair game if JFK was targeting Castro for communists to target JFK. So that might have led to Oswald's motivation. We don't know for sure. In September 1963, Castro threatened assassination against U.S. leaders, again in an article that Oswald probably read. And then, of course, on November 22nd, JFK was assassinated. The Cold War was all important to these developments. If we center the Cold War in a map such as this, we can see what the Cold War did. It encouraged JFK to engage in violence against Castro. It encouraged JFK to act rashly, that is, sponsor secret illegal plans to get rid of Castro. It encouraged Oswald to engage in murder because anything goes, Oswald thought and it encouraged Oswald to seek fame through Cold War actions, such as actions against the President of the United States. Oswald, being a Marxist, thought that that was fair game. Now, Oswald, step by step, was moving in the direction of assassination, partly because of his own personal failures, but also because of the Cold War. In his early life, he was angry at everything that was in his environment because he had a very poor upbringing. He was not well cared for by his mother. He was basically shunted from school to school, from orphan home to orphan home by his mother. And he had a great deal of anger, what he called a mean streak caused by neglect. From 1956 to 59, he was in the Marines. He learned how to be a marksman. And he learned also to hate government authority. He already hated authority, but in the Marines, he came to hate the government. And of course, he designed his plan 
to go to the Soviet Union in 1959, where he was for three years. Oswald did not like living in the Soviet Union because his environment was controlled, his freedom of movements, freedom of action was controlled, and he didn't have much prospect for the future as he had hoped he would. He did get married in the Soviet Union, and he plotted his return to the United States, which was no easy achievement because there was no guarantee that the Russians would let him out or that the Americans would let him back in to the United States. But Oswald managed to pull this off, showing that he was not always a failure in everything that he did. He was a failure in Fort Worth, though, on his return. He couldn't find a job, and once he found a job, he couldn't keep it. And he was in a poor state of mind as 1962 transitioned into 1963. He continued to be a failure in Dallas. He tried to shoot General Edwin Walker and actually shot at him, but missed. And he thereafter went to New Orleans, where he decided that he would brush up his resume so that it would impress Fidel Castro. And he decided he wanted to go to Castro. And in the meantime, he tried to pass out leaflets in favor of Castro on the streets of New Orleans. He tried to infiltrate anti-Castro organizations, hoping that that would impress Fidel Castro. In October, he went to Mexico City in pursuit of a visa to Cuba, but he was unsuccessful, and he had to return to Dallas with no job and no prospects for the future. At this time, Oswald was running out of ideas. He was running out of possibilities. But what you might want to do is build a portfolio of five documents from 1962 and 63 that show the influence of the Cold War on Oswald. In other words, what evidence from what we know about Oswald from the books and writings that you're looking at for this assignment, which documents, historical documents in general, show that the Cold War was a motivation for Oswald. And assemble those five documents and evaluate them. How significant were they? Maybe they weren't that significant. Maybe they were. But that's one way to test and to measure the Cold War's influence on Oswald. What about Oswald's SWOT analysis? What were Oswald's SWOTs? This means strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Well, strength-wise, he was intelligent, politically aware. He had access to the news. Opportunities, the Cold War news, was everywhere. Government leaders were hobbled by hubris. In other words, they believed that they were invulnerable. And so that gave Oswald an opportunity when JFK visited Dallas because security was so lax there. His weaknesses were that he was always impoverished. He had no car. He didn't even know how to drive. He often had no job. He had a personality that made him disliked by almost everyone. And he would not easily earn a person's trust. Threats. The threats, if he was going to go after the president of the United States, was enormous. First of all, because of his poverty, he had no real way to move around easily. He would have had to shoot at JFK with a rifle. How would he secret himself to do that? Therefore, he had lack of access to JFK. He had the problem of escape because he didn't want this to be a suicide mission. And, of course, the Secret Service would be backing Kennedy up, quite literally, in a motorcade through Dallas. In what ways did the twists and turns of time and personality enable the assassination? And once again, the common theme here is the theme of the Cold War being very important in leading to the assassination. The Cold War was not all important. Obviously, there was a great deal of luck on Oswald's part. After all, he got a job at the Texas School Book Depository five weeks before the assassination, which was on the motorcade route. 
And of course, that was pure serendipity for Oswald. But there were things that made his quest to be immortal, successful in that narrow sense. For one thing, Oswald was willing to die in this attempt. And as JFK himself observed to Jacqueline on the morning of November 22nd, 1963, any gunman willing to die would be unstoppable. And JFK loved taking risks. He rode in open motorcades, after all, with thousands of people and thousands of windows unsecured overlooking the motorcade routes. No president since then has ever had an open car motorcade, which is one of the reasons why no presidents have died of assassination since November 22, 1963. JFK, of course, took risks in many ways, not just risks with his security, but also he had affairs while he was president and he trusted the press to keep those things secret, which surprisingly they did. And security was appallingly bad on November 22nd. It's never been so bad since, thank goodness. But this also helped lead to the tragedy. But ultimately, the Cold War must be kept in mind. The Cold War made Oswald determined and also dangerous. He was aware of the fact that the government was plotting against Castro. And so that made Oswald feel like violence in the pursuit of politics was fair game. He might not have thought so had it not been a white-hot Cold War atmosphere. The Cold War faith that the imperial presidency allowed a president to do anything without risk to himself was obviously a lie and a self-delusion that blew back on JFK on 11-22-1963. It turned out that even a nobody could know something about what was going on in the Cold War and might be politically motivated enough and politically intelligent enough to devise a way with the added element of luck to become a force of his own in the Cold War. And therefore, there is no way to understand the Kennedy assassination or to appreciate the fact that there was no need for a conspiracy to explain why it happened without looking at the Cold War. If you look at the Cold War, finally everything falls into place, tragically but truly.